good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second day of week two of uh, DJI New Physics from the Sky. Today we have two seminars. Uh, the first one is by Josh Abbey from Carly IPMU that will tell us about Action Stars. Please. Uh, hopefully I'm on now. Uh, thank you to the organizers for uh, this great opportunity. I'll echo all of the other speakers in saying how nice it is to see people in person. Uh, it's been a long time. Uh, so today I'd like to tell you about stars and um, how you might detect them in uh, axion dark matter experiments from their collapse and explosion. Um, <clears throat> No, I just kind of, I took a cue from Robert last week. Uh, his hypers were very colorful, so I thought it was. Oh. <laughs> uh oh, now it's not working. No, also this. It worked when we checked it. Did it work before? Oh, oh there it goes. Okay. Okay. Um, basic outline give some motivation for this work, use some details about axion stars, and in particular, what happens at and decay constants. Um, and then I'll turn to axion star explosions, uh, how these uh, occur, um, what the uh, signatures would be in experiment, and uh, a more general kind of analysis of other kinds of axion bursts. And then I'll conclude. So this is based on basically these, oops, basically these three works, mostly the ones from the past year. Um, so for my purposes today, um, axions, what I mean by an axion is just a very light pseudoscalar particle um, that's characterized by two energy scales. Uh, one is a very small particle mass, which will be sub EV. So it needs to lie between an EV and about 10 to the minus 21 or 22 EV um, for it to be interesting to me. Uh, in this range, it behaves in a wave-like manner. Um, as opposed to sort of particle-like scattering, you can think of clumps of axion particles oscillating coherently, um, but it needs to be heavier than something to be consistent with astrophysical bounds. Um, and the second um, parameter is the decay constant. Here, uh, it's one over F. Uh, F takes the scale of the self-interactions and also couplings to the standard model. So for QCD axion, for example, this is the self-interaction potential. Um, it depends on M and F in this particular way and has this approximate shift symmetry, um, which is kind of generic for axion-like particles. And I've sort of cherry-picked a few different uh, models uh, to illustrate what I'm interested in, which is uh, uh, the case of large decay constants. So typically experiments search uh, up here. Um, they're uh, shooting for the QCD axion, but they end up uh, sort of in this upper range. Um, but the case of large decay constants is also important. So firstly, because there are models here we'd like to test. Um, there are also axion star related reasons why large decay constants are interesting. For example, um, if axions uh, with large decay constants form axion stars, they could have the sizes and masses of like neutron stars. And you could search for this in uh, gravitational wave experiments or look for multi-messenger signals. Um, and also, if axion stars with large decay constants collapse, there's some claims that they could form black holes, um, which would uh, form black holes in, in different kinds of mass ranges. So they could explain unusual uh, mass black holes, like intermediate mass black holes. Um, so these are just a few motivations for going to large decay constants. Um, and just for later, um, I will mark this sort of QCD axion benchmark of 10 to the minus 5 EV and about to the 12 GeV for numerical approximation later. Um, so this is uh, something like the state of the art in terms of current and future axion experiments. So this is taken from a paper of Andreas Ringwald and friends. Um, so you see in the solid, um, the um, current constraints on the axion photon coupling, mostly from haloscopes. And all of these um, sort of uh, um, shaded lines are for the future. <coughs> And you see again that um, we're even in the uh, far future projections, we're pretty far from probing above, say, like the scale. Um, this is, of course, because the couplings like one half. Um, so, one strategy might be for going to these large decay constants, you may want to look for systems where uh, the suppression of one over F is not necessarily a bug, it may be a feature in some systems. 
So a good example is black hole super radiance. Um, in this case, the constraints come up from the bottom rather than coming down from the top, because um, in such cases, uh, you actually want um, small axion self-interactions rather than large, because when the self-interactions are small, these super radiant clouds can build up lots of mass and spin down rotating black holes. And that's how you set your constraint. Um, so are there other systems like this um, is the question. Uh, okay, so turning now to what axion dark matter sort of looks like, I like this uh, uh, clip from a simulation of a galaxy scale ultralight dark matter simulation. And here you basically see all of these little wave, uh, wave like patterns uh, that would appear when you have um, axion like dark matter. Um, this is a galaxy simulation with a very small, um, very small axion masses, 10 to the minus 22 ish. So, you know, this would be like a whole galaxy, but Um, but the thing I want to draw your attention to is this little spot in the middle, um, which is um, an axion star. Um, these things um, used to be sort of science fiction or speculation in a way, but now there are many simulations showing that different uh, for different um, initial conditions in different mass ranges for axions, um, both cosmological, like the top two, or something more like axion mini clusters, which could be relevant for QCD axions. Um, in, in all of these cases, axion stars. <clears throat> and I'll also, yeah, here they are. Um, and I'll also point out that there was a claim of evidence, you know, possible evidence, it's sigma or something, um, three sigma maybe, um, for a QCD axion star microlensing event. Even if this doesn't quite hold up, at least it's something that can be detectable uh, in the near future. So that's kind of cool. Um, so all of this was about axion stars, but I haven't quite told you what it is yet. So let me try to give you the um, basic story. So an axion star is something that appears in this diagram, any state in this diagram. <clears throat> this is a, a radius versus mass curve uh, determined by link for the ground state of the uh, Gross-Petyevsky process. And you can separate it into three branches. So the first branch, this upper section, is what's called a dilute axion star, and it's characterized by a few attributes. And uh, firstly, the self energy potential is mostly negligible until you get to this uh, maximum mass, which is where axion stars would collapse. Um, but below that, uh, this thing is basically just determined by the kinetic energy and the uh, attractive gravitational energy, and it's all non-relativistic and is a very simple mass radius relation. Um, these things are sometimes called solitons or even oscillatons. Um, and this has basically been known since the 60s, um, what's going on here. Um, above this maximum mass, if you continue, the mass radius relation flips over. So M goes like R, and this is uh, what's sometimes called a transition branch. These states are sometimes also called oscillons, characterized by gravity being negligible self-interactions turning on. So the leading order self-interaction, which is here attractive, um, stabilizes the star, um, uh, uh, it tries to collapse the star, whereas the kinetic energy stabilizes it. Um, but these states are unstable to perturbations and so probably don't have uh, phenomenological consequences. Um, somewhere on this branch, um, decay processes become relevant, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but this was basically pointed out in the, uh, 2011. And then there's a third branch that people have talked about a lot in recent years. Um, it is highly relativistic uh, with field values close to order F. Um, you can't just solve the non-relativistic equations. You need to actually solve the full Klein-Gordon equation. There are multiple energy modes that uh, couple to each other because the binding energy is large. Um, and these things are known to be very unstable to rapid decay through self-interactions. So these are also confusingly called axion stars sometimes. Um, but maybe they're better referred to as axitons, or they're also called oscillons. You can see that the terminology is confusing here. Um, <clears throat> but that's the basic overview, as people usually tell it. Um, zooming in on the upper half of the plot, um, let me tell you about what happens in the non-relativistic level. So uh, this is just from solving the gross petyevsky poisson equations. You basically uh, find solutions like this. These are the wave functions um, that you get from solving this equation. There are three terms here. There's kinetic energy, there's Newtonian gravity, and there's a self-interaction potential, which can in principle be attractive or repulsive. The leading term is usually attractive. 
Um, in this low density region, you find the dilute states where gravity is relevant, and you find the transition states where self interactions are relevant. Uh, and they are cut off by uh, this maximum mass here, which I've given um, in physical units. You know, for the QCD benchmark, it's about 10 to the minus 11 solar mass, and maybe the size of a very large asteroid, something like that. So um, if you want to go to larger uh, binary. You can't just solve Poisson equations, and there are different methods for trying to solve the Klein-Gordon equations. You could just simulate it, and people have done that. Um, but we uh, chose to take a perturbative approach. <clears throat> so uh, our method is based on one of the earliest uh, boson star papers from 1969. And basically what they did was use statistic equations, expand them to linear order in creation and annihilation operators, the ground state, so these are ground state solutions. So you should be able to find them in the ground state field theory. Um, and if you start with this operator and you take relativistic limit, you arrive at the exact same equations that I've already shown. Um, but you can actually do this in the relativistic limit as well. In order to do that, you need to include higher order contributions to this operator. So the leading order term here is, uh, is, is what the original Ruffini Bonazzola did. And we've shown that this is equivalent to the gross pitievsky poisson equations in the relevant non-relativistic limit. Um, so that's nice. Um, but uh, what this field operator does is it includes um, higher orders in the creation and annihilation operators of the ground state, which back react on the bound state. So you can have, for example, modes of energy 2e, 3e, 4e, and so on, back react on the ground state wave function and you get modifications to the bound state. Um, so that's the first thing that's included here. Um, we have shown how you can um, organize this in a, uh, as a power series in this small parameter delta. So delta is um, small precisely when the eigen energy of the ground state is um, close to the particle mass, which is the non-relativistic limit. Um, and finally, um, you can include scattering states in this theory. So this is something that the gross pitievsky equation can never include because the non-relativistic limit is a number conserving theory, although axions can decay. Um, so in this theory, you can actually include the, those scattering states and just compute decay processes by um, n to n minus one or minus three or whatever um, matrix elements. Um, and so we've shown how to do this as well. So this is kind of an overview of a lot of work um, but I'll give you some of the flavor of it and the results here in a second. Um, so if you solve, um, so firstly, um, if you just naively solve the gross pitievsky poisson equations in a region where they're not applicable, which is in this sort of dense branch limit, then you find this dashed curve, and people have done this, um, and they find masses that basically uh, grow as R cubed. You get roughly constant density solutions out to arbitrarily large masses However, if you try to do this self-consistently, in our case, perturbatively, uh, in this binding energy parameter, you find, uh, firstly, that you get deviations already before you reach the dense branch, um, and you find uh, uh, significant deviations in the mass radius relation, and also that you need to self-consistently cut off this calculation at you know, some very large delta. Here we chose uh, 0.7, which is already too large for the uh, perturbative approach. Um, this just tells you that you need to solve the uh, relativistic equations. Um, if you include the decay processes from the scattering states, then uh, you find that states roughly starting here on the transition branch and all the way out to the dense branch are unstable, meaning that uh, you first calculate the bound state, and then you calculate the relevant decay rate from the scattering processes, from the annihilation processes, and you just require that the lifetime is longer than the age of the universe. And you find that on this um, solid branch, the solid uh, on the solid line, the um, the decay rates are always very very small. In fact, there's a rapid transition from extremely stable to extremely unstable, um, and it's marked by an almost exact um, mass here. And it's almost independent of the particle physics parameters, by the way. Um, okay. <clears throat> uh, so all of this leads to kind of the first. Uh, main result here, which is um, in, the, in the figure that I showed you at the start, the position of the dilute branch shifts down into the left as you increase the decay constant. 
And I've just told you that the um, position of this uh, large density cutoff uh, on the dense branch also shifts to the left. So as you increase the decay constant high enough, eventually these two points should coincide. And it turns out that these two things coincide at roughly 10 to the 18 GeV. Um, this is where uh, self-consistency of the perturbative theory actually tells you that um, there is no dense branch of axion stars that you can calculate. Um, uh, so that's interesting. But even more interesting, I think, is that even before this happens, at very close to 10 to the 17 GeV, these decay processes start to creep onto the dilute branch of, branch of axion stars, typically assumed to be uh, stable. In the like basic story I told you, these dilute states were always stable. Um, but if you compute these things consistently uh, at uh, decay constants larger than 10 to the 17, actually the dilute states close to the maximum mass uh, will rapidly decay. Um, so what does this mean? <clears throat> so whereas before, you could have a situation that I'll tell you about in a second, where um, these dilute states accrete to their maximum mass and collapse um, because they're still stable at this point. At large F, they can no longer reach that point. Instead, when they accrete to a certain point, they will rapidly burn off those, those axions, right? So probably you will have buildup of axion stars at a very um, particular mass range up here, and they can't accrete further. Um, and you can see basically the same information in the figure on the right. Here, this is the mass compared to uh, the decay constant, and you see the decay instability turns on before the gravitational instability you know, for F larger than 10 to the 17 GeV. Yes. Uh, what, I, what are the decay product of the axion star? So these are decays through self-interactions. So you have, for example, many axions that are bound to the star annihilate to fewer axions that are emitted. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So the leading processes are things like three annihilate to one or four annihilate to two, that sort of thing. Um, okay. Um, so that was sort of the. Um, now I'll tell you about uh, collapse and explosion, which is kind of the main event. So um, these collapses uh, were a topic of a lot of interest in 2016. There were met, there were several papers, including ours and the simulation that I'll tell you about, and there were a few more even. Um, but I believe our paper was the first that got this basic physics right. Um, and then it was rapidly confirmed by the uh, simulation that was being done, you know, unbeknownst to us. Uh, so let me tell you the basic story. So suppose you start with a stable axion star on the dilute branch. So now we're assuming the decay constant is small enough that you can ignore the first part of the talk. Um, this stable axion star might uh, grow in mass, either through accretion of background axions or through mergers or something like that, until it gets to the maximum mass here and then it will gravitationally collapse. This gravitational collapse process is largely non-relativistic because you're still sort of at the top of this plot. So it's basically spherically symmetric, non-relativistic, you know, very easy to approximate. But at some point, these decay processes, uh, relativistic decay processes turn on and uh, you have an explosion of um, axions, uh, of bound axions converting to relativistic axions that escape the star. Um, this process is called a Bose Nova, um, and the energy emitted uh, in for QCD axion stars, at least, can be a, an order one fraction of the total mass of the star, so 30% or 60%, something like that in the simulation. Um, so that's pretty cool. So this could be a lot of mass. For QCD axions, it's 10 to the minus 11 solar mass. For some ALP, it could be as much as a solar mass. Maybe. Um, what happens after that is still sort of unknown in the simulation they uh, show that the remnant non-relativistic uh, part, the parts that don't escape, whatever this uh, remaining cold axion background is, remains gravitationally bound, but not in its ground state. So maybe this thing kind of reforms an axion star after some amount of time, but it's not really known. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the simulation because it's the input to the study that we did. Um, <clears throat> So uh, in this simulation, they basically do all of the things that I uh, told you you needed to do. So they start from the non-relativistic equations. They find these uh, dilute bound states. They uh, let them go to the maximum mass, and they watch them collapse. Initially, they're non-relativistic, but then they solve relativistic equations 
to account for the number changing processes um, and the axions emitted from the star. So they find that um, uh, 30, I mean, I'll tell you about this in a second. Um, uh, and they, um, yeah, anyway, so they simulate the process. That's what I want to say. Uh, so here is one of their main results. So, so uh, this is the density of the axion star at the core, so r equals zero, as a function of time normalized to m. And here in the first part of the plot, you see this smooth non-relativistic collapse. So the density is smoothly rising until it reaches some very large value where um, phi is of order f, basically. And then you have this um, sort of craziness, which is the explosion. And then it sort of settles and it explodes again, and then it settles and explodes again. And this happens you know, three to five or six times in their simulation. Um, but of interest to us is that each of these particular explosions is fairly fast. It's only a few hundred one over m cycles. So you have a very rapid emission of axions and then a pause, and then very rapid emission of axions and then pause. And this happens for you know, a few thousand one over m cycles. And then eventually there's a remnant and a bunch of relativistic guys go out. Um, uh, the other thing they did was they um, calculated the power spectrum. Uh, they caught the um, relativistic particles at the edge of the simulation and they found the, um, uh, the power spectrum. So this is DEDK normalized to, you know, uh, uh, you know, in an appropriately normalized way, let's say. Basically what we need to know is that um, this thing is a, a clean function of K over M. It doesn't depend strongly on the decay constant in the simulation. And there, there's this kind of peaked structure. Um, this peaked structure, uh, we think, although haven't proved, we think that these peaks are related to um, particle, particle annihilation processes of the kind I, I pointed out to you. So for example, um, the leading annihilation process should be something like three axions annihilate to one that goes out. And if the three coming in are, are approximately non-relativistic, then you can calculate the one that comes out and it will have momentum of order 2.5 or three uh, in units of M. And that's basically where this first peak is. And probably you can do the same uh, for these higher order peaks, although it's a more messy process. Um, in any case, um, what we did was just take this first relativistic peak. So the first peak that has uh, momentum greater than M uh, it is centered around 2.4 and with a momentum spread of order one in units of M. Uh, and the total energy emitted in this peak is uh, large um, and a particular function of F and M. So these we took as inputs from the simulation, the duration of the burst, the peak momentum and its spread and the total energy output. Um, and because these are given as functions of the particle mass and decay constant, you can basically um, uh, calculate the signal over a wide range of sort of ALP um, parameter space. A um, couple of things we leave out. So in our, in our study, um, we ignore the fact that there are multiple explosions here. So to leading order, you might think if all these explosions were close together, you should just get um, you know, a factor of two or five larger signal. It might be more complicated than that. So we decided to be sort of pessimistic here because these different peaks can sort of interfere with each other. So you might worry that the signal might be some more complicated function than just the sum of these individual peaks. So uh, we ignored the rest of the peaks and just took single peaks. Secondly, uh, we also ignored these peaks. Uh, so we only took the first relativistic peak in the power spectrum and ignored the higher orders. Um, to, to calculate the experimental signal. Um, again, because we think, that, so uh, for future work, you know, we intend to um, include all of these effects and see what the actual signal shape. But for our purposes, we just wanted to treat this as a sort of delta function and this as a sort of single, single burst uh, with a known width. Um, and we went from there. Yes. Uh, in your Previous, previous slide, um, the, is not the mass of the axon star supposed to decrease after X, uh, each explosion hmm. and then maybe the peak to decrease? I'm sorry, can you, I don't uh, understand. After each, each, each explosion, you yeah. lose a, a fraction of the mass of yes. the axon star. So is not the, the, the maxima of the peak supposed to decrease? 
Is it, is it not re related to the mass, the, the in, total mass? In this figure? Yes. So some fraction of the axion star mass is lost in each explosion, that's right. Um, the power spectrum here is normalized by the number of explosions. So uh, each of these explosions in the simulation is sort of self-similar, um, although the total amount of mass is less each time. Okay. Right? Does that answer your Yes, yes. But at some point, then, uh, uh, do, do you reach your remnant? So what is the number of maximal number of explosions that you can mm -hmm. reach? So in the simulation, you know, they showed a few examples. Um, they, the number of explosions varied between two and I think six, um, depending on the input parameters. But they always found that when you normalize by the number of explosions, the power spectrum looks the same and it's independent of the decay constant. So you can basically take explosion as being, you know, in isolation, uh, any explosion is as good as any other. And it has this power spectrum. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yes. I have a related question. So from the power spectrum, you can see that it goes down. But why is the central density during the explosion every time is roughly the same? I mean, in the lab plot, I mean, you can see during the, during the explosion, row zero and density at the center is roughly at the same height. Is there a simple way to understand this? I, I think so. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, this is a log plot. And at the end of the day, only, only, only 30 to 60% of the total mass of the star was lost. Ah, okay. So even after five or six explosions, an order one amount of mass was remaining. Yeah. Okay. Good. Other questions while we're here? Um, good. So um, let's start with like just a naive signal analysis. So here's just a picture of what's going on again, a slightly different picture. So axion star grows in mass, it collapses, goes at Bose Nova. And now you, uh, let's say it happens a distance R from your experiment, in this case, a telescope looking thing. Um, so uh, the energy density that you find at the uh, position of the detector uh, will, can be approximated this way. So uh, E here is the total energy density integrated from the peak in the previous slide. Um, so far, nothing, um, only that it forms axion stars. Oh, have you thought about, is there a cosmologically consistent history that can form axion for them? Um, so it, it's a great question. Um, so if you take, for example, QCD axions, I think there is a plausible cosmological story to do with um, axion mini clusters relaxing into axion stars. Um, I think all the pieces of that process have basically been worked out from the you know, peak eusymmetry breaking to formation of axion mini clusters with some mass distribution. And then individual mini clusters have been simulated and found to form axion stars inside with an order one fraction of their mass. Um, I'm, not, I'm talking about the collapse part. Axion stars will form. Mm -hmm. The question is, will they have the high enough densities to collapse so that self interactions become important? Uh, yes. So um, that's right. Um, yeah, so two things. So first, firstly, to really answer the question, you would need to, to calculate what, it, what is the uh, mass distribution of axion stars, uh, which I think has not been done in any precise way in any model. Um, however, it, it also depends on a second thing, which is sort of, the, sort of a hidden assumption here that I pointed out before. Um, uh, the... Um, the mass distribution of axion stars won't be constant with time because axion stars can accrete axions from the background. Um, and also they will undergo mergers. So if you have QCD axions forming axion stars, you could have you know, many trillions of axion stars that collide very frequently. Uh, have, you done, have you done estimates of that? I, the bottom line is I don't know of a cosmologically consistent scenario where what you're describing can happen. Um, yeah, I, I confess that um, the mass distribution of axion stars has not been worked out. Um, so we don't know whether 
the um, the peak of the distribution will be many orders of magnitude from the maximum or close to the maximum. Um, I agree that we don't know. Anyway, yes, that's an important part to work out. Sure, I agree with you. Other questions while we stop? Okay. Um, so, uh, so this is the basic. This is the basic picture. Um, if you just assume that this um, axion star collapse occurs at distance r from your detector, then the uh, energy density at the position of your detector will look something like this. So, in the numerator, you have the peak energy uh, from the integrated uh, collapse energy on the previous slide. Uh, it uh, decreases as one over r squared, just from ordinary spherical wave spreading. And then there's a, a spread in the energy over the duration of the burst, this delta x, which was very short in the um, simulation. And if you just input some parameters here, it looks like uh, about a 10 to the 7 or 10 to the 8 um, enhancement compared to the uh, ordinary dark matter background for some choice of f for, some, for very nearby explosions only, um, but dropping fast with r. Um, so it looks like you might gain in terms of density, but you... Um, you likely, uh, the naive expectation is that you should lose a lot in terms of oscillator quality. The reason why dark matter axions are uh, possible to detect is largely because you can integrate over the six oscillators of the dark matter field and uh, accumulate over a long period of time. However, relativistic axions are incoherent waves and they will largely cancel each other out if you're not careful. And so the oscillator quality is very low. You actually um, don't get any enhancement from that. Um, so if you just use this naive guess, you might say that the um, sensitivity you can achieve relative to a dark matter experiment will be uh, given by some ratio of the densities times some ratio of these quality factors, uh, which means that you may only be sensitive to very nearby explosions. So this is if you just take the, um, this is the same scaling that was found by uh, Hitoshi and friends looking for relative on background. I'm sorry. Rho star is the density on the at the Earth at the position of the Earth. What it's, is rho star or inside the star? It's the density of the relativistic axions after they've traveled to the Earth. So they've diminished by r squared at least. The density inside the well, at the end point of collapse, phi is of order f. Um, the density is of order m squared f squared. Still, what density does it start from compared to CDM? Um, it depends on if you're talking about the initial dilute axion star or yeah. in the final part of collapse. Asking about star, how, how compared to CDM? Um, it's, um, if I could get the parametrics right, I mean, it depends on the mass and decay constant, right? Um, you know, it, it can be very large. It can be 10 to the 10, uh, 10 to the 20. I mean, it, it depends a lot on what you take for the mass and decay constant. I don't remember their parametrics offhand. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I can do it for, I mean, the, the uh, maximum mass goes like F over M and the uh, corresponding radius goes like one over F time. So M over R cubed goes like, F over M times M cubed, F cubed. So it goes like, the density goes like uh, F to the fourth, maybe. If I did that right. Okay, anyway, I mean, it, it could be very large. Well, this is another confusion because if it's I add, at collapse, they cannot be more dense than 10 to the 6 CDM because they cannot they can only collapse after after matter radiation quality, similar to what mini clusters do. So that means that the whole process of the growth must have been pretty. If I don't know what the number is, how many orders of magnitude in density in order to get the density to what you need it to be. Um. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I don't know offhand, I don't know offhand the density numbers, but you're right that in some region of parameter space, um, this will be an issue. Um, but yeah, I, I'm yeah. just trying to understand what the cosmological history is of this model to make it relevant. 
Yeah, yeah. I, so this this is largely um, uh, this is not taking into account the cosmological history. That's a separate question that needs to be considered. So let me suggest to continue this discussion. We have after the second talk, there is a discussion session that is as mm. long as we want. So please. Uh, okay. So, so this is um, I can speed up a little. Um, this is the basically naive scaling you might have expected, but actually this is uh, not as pessimistic as you would think. So here are some reasons why that may be optimistic, and then I'll tell you why overall we're um, uh, overall we are optimistic uh, compared to this naive guess. So firstly, uh, in the estimation that I told you, um, I took the duration of the axion burst to be the uh, duration at the position of the source, but that's not the right thing to do because the, uh, the wave will spread in flight. So if you start with a very narrow peak, you actually will get a large amount of wave spreading as this thing travels to the earth. So even if delta x burst is small, delta x will be very long, right? So actually the energy density will drop even more. Uh, in fact, delta x goes like r. So if the explosion is our distance r away, then, um, then you actually lose in the density by an additional factor of r. Uh, so the energy density drops like r cubed, not like r squared uh, overall. Um, so that's unfortunate. Um, second, uh, however, um, this isn't as bad as it may seem because uh, although this burst is long, uh, you, if you run the experiment long enough, in our case, we assumed a typical experiment runs for a year, you can still catch all the signal. So even though the energy density at any given time is low, the duration of the signal you know, becomes longer, and so you can catch all of the energy density. So you maybe regain a factor of R that way. Secondly, and this was kind of a key insight um, to making this viable, um, this story about the coherence of the um, relativistic modes was a little naive on the previous slide. So it's true that if you put your detector right at the position of the source, what you would see is a bunch of incoming, totally incoherent waves with a very short duration and they would all basically hit the detector at roughly the same time. However, again, because the detector will be very far from a, any axion burst, um, the momentum modes will have had time to separate from each other. So the fast, even uh, in this momentum peak, the fastest axions will travel a little bit faster than the slowest axions. So you'll actually see a much, sharp, a much narrower peak at any given time in the experiment. Um, so this means if you have a broadband experiment that can still capture all the energy in all of these different bins, then um, you can effectively integrate each peak separately, and each peak looks much more coherent than uh, the initial burst would have initially. Um, so you, again, maybe regain a factor of R um, that way. <coughs> um, so here's the up The question, uh, one of the key questions is, um, uh, this is one way to ask the question, in a typical dark matter experiment, uh, would you expect it to be as sensitive or more sensitive to one of these bursts compared to what it's looking for, the dark matter? Uh, and here is the expression given in the paper, which is a complicated function of all of the time scales in the experiment. I won't go into this in detail, um, but it has this factor of the square root of the ratio of densities, but rather than a simple square root of the quality factors, you get a complicated function of the time scales. Um, for the experimental sensitivity, we took uh, you know, the optimistic long-term goal of abracadabra. Um, I know that this is um, an old paper and also abracadabra has recently merged with DM radio, I think. So the status of this whole thing is a little um, uncertain. However, you know, we needed to take a benchmark, so we took their benchmark. Um, the other important question, which is actually, uh, it encodes the question of, of Mina before, um, what is the average time you would have to wait for a burst that is at, at least a distance r away, or at most a distance r away? Um, so uh, this basically is a function of the number of axion stars within a distance r times something about the uh, average lifetime of an axion star, right? How often do they get to the point where they have enough mass to collapse? And this is a complicated story that we did not take into account here. We just assumed that this thing had a basically galaxy scale lifetime. Although, uh, you know, you can see in the plot how this shifts uh, if you take something else. <clears throat> um, so if you assume that these things have an order one fraction of the dark matter, then you can calculate the um, total number of burst making objects. For axion stars, uh, you basically uh, um, arrive at the result that 
um, you would find at least, you would find around one axion star within 100 AU if, if axion stars are one fraction of dark matter. The main result. Um, this is the sensitivity curve for future abracadabra to a burst like this um, in the plane of one over F compared to M. Um, the blue contours are contours of sensitivity. Um, so a couple of things to point out here. Um, the dashed lines are the uh, masses of the axion stars involved. The blue shaded region is the QCD axion and the green uh, regions are the constraints. So sensitivity bands are for different choices of R. See that we're sensitive to bursts that are as near or as far as 10 parsecs, I should say. Um, what we thought was cool about this is that although the coupling in any experiment goes our signal goes like F because the size of the explosion goes like F. So actually you um, would be as sensitive to explosions down here as you would be up here. Um, we thought that was kind of, uh, but by the way, this lower region is from the first half of the talk above 10 to the 17 GeV, you don't expect these bells and OV. I didn't say that. Um, yeah, so that's from the previous paper. <clears throat> Thirdly, again, this is this sort of hidden assumption. Uh, you need to assume something about the, uh, effectively the mass distribution and the accretion rate or uh, collision rate or how quickly axion stars arrive at these uh, benchmarks. So what we actually find is not so optimistic in the end. So the um, number of axion stars within say 10 parsecs, uh, assuming a 10 giga year uh, explosion time scale is uh, the region above this red curve. And you see that it doesn't really overlap with the 10 parsec uh, blue region. Um, if there are ways to get away Technological history where um, you can have smaller time scales, or um, once you take in these higher order bursts, these contours will shift to the right. So in any case, at this point, we're just uh, showing what they are. <clears throat> and finally, um, we thought this was uh, worth pointing out. Um, in another simulation of the same group uh, as the one I told you, the catch group, um, they found that axion stars collapsing in a particular range of photon couplings would actually uh, convert axions to photons as well through parametric resonance. So um, the photon coupling goes like one over F. So it basically lands in this upper part of the curve. So there are regions of parameter space where you would see mostly photons, regions where you would see mostly axions and regions where you would see some mix of both. So potentially something like a multi-messenger signal, although you, know, you need you know, to be in a particular range of parameters for that to work. Um, for nuclear couplings, you might expect this to be uh, better because um, uh, nuclear couplings are proportional to the gradient of the axion field. And the gradient of the axion field is something like its velocity. So for dark matter experiments, this gives you a minus three suppression. But for relativistic axions, you don't see that. So actually the ratio of uh, coupling sensitivity acquires a factor of 10 to the three um, in favor of the bursts. So here is the um, potential sensitivity ratio to experiments uh, looking for bursts. And you see that you know, there's a lot of range for distant explosions where a search for bursts would be more, uh, more sensitive to than a search for um, dark matter. But uh, that's not a really fair comparison because searches for dark matter can be uh, resonant or broadband and all the good experiments search looking for nuclear couplings are resonant, which would be very difficult to search for bursts. So actually uh, what you would need is not only um, an experiment that is more sensitive than the projection for, um, for resonant searches, you would need it to also be broadband. So we really need new ideas here um, to take advantage of this 10 to the three um, enhancement. <clears throat> and finally, uh, I know that I'm out of time, I think. Um, uh, you could, uh, instead of looking at the particular case of axion star explosions, you could just say, suppose a large burst of axions coincides with some astrophysical event and uh, look at what the sensitivity would be as a function of the same input parameters. So here on the left, you all you have to assume is that the um, signal to noise ratio in Abracadabra is greater than one and the number of explosions is equal to one and you arrive at a set of parameters that you could be sensitive to if such explosions were to occur. Um, so here it's uh, totally agnostic about not only cosmological history, but also the source of the burst. This is something like a model independent 
um, search, right? Uh, you look for any uh, a burst of size 10 to the minus three solar mass that occurred within a parsec of Earth would be detectable by abracadabra. Uh, and similarly for a, a uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, 0.1 solar mass at a kiloparsec and so on. Um, so if there are other sources of axion bursts, this may be a nice way to find it. Um, and this is just, you know, the same thing, but for different choices of n, if you require that there are 10 to the four of these events, that would be um, even better. <clears throat> Last thing is that we're hosting a conference online. Uh, it's a little bit hard for European time because we're in Japan, but if you're a night owl or if you're in the US or something like that, please uh, check us out. Um, and that's all. I'll just leave you with my conclusions. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Are there any other quick questions? Keep in mind we have a whole discussion slot for later. Yeah. Hey, so thanks for the talk. Uh, so now so, so now you're looking for these uh, boosted uh, actions coming from the stars. Uh, is, is the actions uh, dark matter or are those uh, dark matter? Um, so the axions would have to be dark matter to form axion stars yeah. to collapse right. and give our signal. That's right. So th there is a cloud the detector. Do you mean would the relativistic axions interact with the dark matter background? Up, up. Um, we didn't think about it. Um, I don't know how self interactions to think about it. You know, I mean, especially if you're looking at large F, which was one of the motivations here. Then, okay, I'm sure that there's no effect, but. I see. Yeah, we, we haven't thought about it. Maybe it's worth looking at. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Any question from Zoom, maybe? Okay, then let's thank Josh again.